Good afternoon uh, to, to all, all of our participants and attendees. Uh, I'm delighted to, to welcome you. Um, uh, it, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce you um, to Ken Ludmerer. Um, doc, Dr. Ludmerer is a professor of medicine, uh, of history of medicine and the Mabel Dorn Reader, distinguished professor um, in the history of medicine at Wash University, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and Dr. Ludmera is recognized uh, by many people for his outstanding dedication to residency training. Um, Ken Ludmera is perhaps best known as a master clinician and a teacher. Uh, his passion for system improvement has earned him the role of the country's leading ambassador of the principles and values of graduate medical education. Uh, his, his recent book um, called Let Me Heal provides the definitive account of the evolution of the graduate medical education system and defines the principles of educational excellence and defines the path to realizing these principles. Um, that book, uh, which came out around tw 2015, provided the intellectual foundation of the new set of common program requirements that govern all residency and clinical specialty training programs in the country since 2017. Uh, Professor Ludmer is, um, is working on, on a new book uh, called Medicine and did I get this right? Medicine and black and white? Medicine in black and white. In black Working. and white. Yeah. Um, which will be the next book that, that he will be uh, completing in a while. Um, uh, Ken Ludmer's research interests have been in the history of American medicine with particular reference to the 19th and 20th centuries. And his work is focused on understanding medicine in a broad intellectual, social, and cultural context. I, I mean, some of the older and great books uh, also called the Time to Heal, uh, the, the one in 20, 20, 2005, was Time to Heal American Medical Education from the Turn of the Century from Oxford University Press. And in 1999, uh, Ken wrote uh, Time to Heal American Medical Education from the turn of the century to the era of managed care. Um, Ken, Ken Ludmer's honors include the Distinguished Medical Alumnus Award from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, the Association of American Medical Colleges Abraham Flexner Award for Distinguished Service to Medical Education, and his election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Just in the last day or so, so um, uh, Dr. Ludmerer received the John A. Guy-Nip Award for the ACGME for Distinguished Service in Graduate Medical Education. I think that arrived yesterday. Did I get that right, Ken? Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I could go on about uh, Ken having earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard in 68 and his master's and MD degrees from Johns Hopkins in 1971 and 73 and his training at the Barnes Hospital, um, postgraduate training at Harvard, uh, chief residency at Barnes and joining the Wash Washington University faculty in 1979. Today's talk, today's talk is entitled Reflections on Medicines social contract, and we're ex encouraging our attendees um, to submit um, chats or, or to raise questions when, when the talk is over. Um, Ken says he would love to have that sort of uh, interaction for, from our attendees. Thank you very much. And Ken, it's, it's an honor and delight to welcome you. Well, thank you, Mark. Is it, uh, can you hear me? Beautifully, yes. Good, good. Oh, well, thank you. It's uh, 
great pleasure and privilege for me to be here with you today. Uh, I've long uh, admired greatly Mark Siegler and Mindy Schwartz and all the work that they've done and the fine, wonderful people that they are. And I've also long been a great admirer of the University of Chicago, the McLean Center, the Department of Medicine, the medical school, the whole university. So it really is very meaningful to me to have the opportunity to talk with you today. As you see, I'm going to be reflecting on medicine social contract. Uh, as I pursue this, I hope to portray the complexity of the many issues that uh, we encounter. Uh, there are no simple problems or simplistic solutions. And if I can convey this complexity, uh, the pre presentation will have been a success. And as Dr. Siegler mentioned, we'll have plenty of time for the discussion and questions and comments. And uh, uh, nothing should be considered off, limit in off limits in terms of uh, the questions. Uh, there is no subject or topic that should be considered out of bounds. Uh, next slide, please. No disclosures. Uh, next slide. Well, when we speak of the social contract between medicine and society, it's important to recognize that this is an implicit contract. There's nothing explicit about it. It's not a, uh, a legal document, but the implicit understanding that the medical profession and academic medical centers in particular have to serve society and to society to serve medicine. Uh, each side has a responsibility to the other. The medical profession has the responsibility to serve, to do everything it can to improve the public health, as well as the health of the individual patients, and to be a serving, altruistic, and highly competent profession. Uh, the society has the responsibility to allow the doctors to do their good work assuming the good work is documented, and to provide the uh, material and psychological and psychic support necessary for the profession to do its work, academic medical centers in particular. Uh, I would point out the academic focus to this conversation because we speak of the uh, social contract with, as it emerged with the emergence of the modern medical school and the academic medical center. Uh, there was really no need for society to provide academic medicine, uh, lots of funds and support before there was academic medicine and something to support. So this, uh, the social contract emerged with the emergence of the modern medical school, teaching hospital, academic medical center, and the scientific medical profession. It also might be helpful to point out that the social contract is not the same as professionalism, a word that we use very frequently today. The social contract is institutional. It doesn't pertain to the actions of individual physicians. Rather, it relates to the responsibilities of academic medicine in particular and the profession as a whole to do its good work. And in addition, as I indicated before, the social contract is a relatively recent event in the evolution of medicine, uh, perhaps 120, 140, 150 years old, uh, we've had the, the responsibilities of individual physicians to their patients going back to the times of Hippocrates and before. But the idea of an institutional or a professional responsibility is a much more recent development. Uh, next slide, please. That to understand the social contract, it might be useful to put into perspective where medical education began in this country. If one goes to the Civil War or immediately after the Civil War, medical education was a very simple and easy process. 
medical school everywhere consisted of two four month series of lectures with the, le with the second term being an identical repeat of the first. Uh, instruction was wholly didactic, lectures, textbooks, memorization. There was no practical experience of any sort. What little science was taught was uh, taught without the use of laboratories. And similarly in the clinical work, instruction was wholly didactic. There was no meaningful contact between students and patients at that time. So when a physician graduated and went into practice, that individual was literally going into practice. Uh, that person had not seen a patient as part of his medical training. It was easy to get into medical school because entrance requirements were non-existent. Uh, even literacy was not necessarily a requirement. There's a famous anecdote from Harvard Medical School when in 1870, the faculty for the first time considered having written examinations and uh, one, the professor of surgery stood up locally objected. We can't have written examinations. 60% of our students cannot read or write. Uh, the schools were very uh, uh, unimposing places. Uh, the second floor above a, a bank on the, uh, or a corner drugstore would suffice. A school that had a simple building of its own was considered amply endowed. And the function of the school was uh, teaching alone. There was no research or investigation or any movement to try to make the medicine of the future better as part of this. And things began to change in the 1870s. And this is a story I told in my first book, The Medical Education, Learning to Heal. And there were changes at Michigan and Harvard and Pennsylvania. And this culminated with the opening of the Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1889 and the Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School in 1893, uh, which was a fully mature modern medical school with uh, rigorous admissions requirements, four years of instruction of nine month terms, uh, rigorous scientific training, uh, uh, clinical clerkships at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, a faculty of scholars who were involved with investigation and research, not just teaching medicine. And the system by the opening of Johns Hopkins was in place. It took another generation for the system to become generalized because uh, he, uh, the medical schools needed uh, money and resources and clinical facilities and labs and buildings and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that took a generation or so to accumulate, but by 1920, the system was in place. And as the system was being put together, the social contract became very clear and was uh, adhered to. And it worked. Uh, the, uh, the reason was that it became very clear that how a doctor was trained mattered to the results of that physician's patients. It became clear that medical research made a difference to making medicine better in the future. And it also became clear that with this reshaped medical school that uh, much more money, physical resources and clinical resources were needed uh, and it required help from outside. This is not a, a, a uh, these were not expenses that medical schools could reach from tuition alone. The money initially was private. Um, uh, it came from large donors. Uh, Robert Brookings at, at Washington University, uh, John Rockefeller at University of Chicago. Uh, the foundations during this period assumed a major role with the most notable being the General Education Board, which 
provided in its lifetime close to a billion dollars of 1910, 1920 money into medical schools. This was the largest philanthropy of John Rockefeller Sr. Ironically, uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie, whose foundation sponsored the Flexner Report, never became a major funder of medical schools. He said that Flexner's work convinced him that medicine, medical schools were businesses and he wasn't going to contribute to the support of anyone else's business. So Carnegie was one of, or was an exception and not being a generous funder. Um, and the states got involved with the support of their individual uh, public medical schools, whether University of Michigan, University of Maryland, whatever. And then after World War II, uh, the federal government uh, uh, entered the picture in a very large scale and became the dominant funder of uh, academic medicine. Uh, the NIH uh, evolved into its present form after World War II and its billions of dollars became vital to research and also vital to the medical school because through the indirect payments, medical schools receive, uh, much could be funded in terms of further capital expansion and uh, other costs of supporting a medical school. After 1965, Medicare and Medicaid uh, entered the picture of major funders. Their uh, impact has been primarily on graduate medical education because it's through Medicare funding that the salaries of our residents uh, are paid. Uh, but in addition, uh, the private support remained very significant. So the government is an add-on to ongoing private support, not a replacement of it. And we think today of uh, major institutions such as Howard Hughes, Wellcome Trust, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, or very wealthy individuals such as Michael Bloomberg, who last year endowed 150, yes, 150 endowed chairs at Johns Hopkins. Uh, in addition, uh, the, the foundations and, and private individual philanthropy uh, has the ability to punch above its weight uh, by uh, funding exploratory projects or innovative areas that the government may be unwilling to take a chance on. So for example, uh, as Dr. Siegler mentioned, my new interest has been uh, racial equity in medicine. The, the largest supporters and advocates of, of this have been, have been the foundations uh, since uh, uh, even before the civil rights uh, legislation. Uh, the Macy Foundation was a major funder of all sorts of programs and public policy development. Uh, that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation entered that arena in the 1970s. Uh, so the uh, role of private philanthropy, in my view, remains extremely important, even though quantitatively the federal government has become the largest single sponsor. Next slide, please. Well, the social contract has resulted in many successes. Uh, in essence, medicine has delivered. And here it's helpful to have the uh, perspective of, of, of history. Uh, to many medical students, and I was among them, medicine seems to have begun the day he or she enters med medical school. But in fact, medicine has been evolving for a while and, and even mid-career doctors uh, uh, have witnessed extraordinary change and development and have had to relearn medicine at least once. If you move to senior doctors, uh, the transformation and improvement of medical knowledge and practice becomes even more apparent. If one compares the early 20th century with the early 21st century, uh, the differences are simply astonishing in terms of the capacity of medicine to understand and to heal. Uh, the most significant developments of medicine, in my view, 
uh, are uh, on this list, I consider the most important development from the basic sciences, the identification and uh, uh, physical structuring of DNA. I consider the most important diagnostic development to be the emergence of non-invasive imaging. And I would uh, argue that the most important therapeutic development has been the creation and development of antibiotics. Uh, I would also add to the success of medicine that as part of the emergence of academic medicine, medical education became uh, launched and, um, and embedded in the university. Uh, it's a university enterprise. The goal is to provide university level professional education and not mere vocational training. And this is a very important difference to understand and a huge achievement that we have made medicine a university enterprise. Uh, by university enterprise, I mean acquiring the ability to adapt to the future, not merely to learn for the here and now. It means an emphasis on the higher order cognitive skills of analysis, synthesis, and problem solving, not the lower order cognitive skills of recall and recognition. It means reading to build knowledge, explore problems, and deepen understanding, not just to acquire isolated facts. It means understanding why something should be done, not just knowing what to do. It involves the cultivation of critical skills, a distrust of authority, a recognition of what is not known, and the ability to tolerate and manage uncertainty. University education requires education uh, requires inquiry and curiosity to be part of the daily learning environment in contrast to vocational training, which could occur in isolation from research. Education also requires learners to teach in contrast to training where learners learn but rarely taught. Education is value-laden, involving a reflection on the values of the profession, the type of doctor a trainee wanted to be, the role of the doctor in the profession and the community, and the responsibilities of the profession to create a better healthcare system and a healthier society. All in contrast to training, which is much more content-driven and value-neutral. In short, university professional education involves intellectual, intellectual inquiry, not merely practical training for the forthcoming job. Now, as medicine has matured and demonstrated its value to society, uh, society by and large has executed its end of the social contract, is provide provided abundant, abundant financial resources uh, and clinical resources for academic medical centers to do their good work and for hospitals to carry on the application of knowledge to the care of patients. It's also resulted in considerable respect and autonomy for the medical profession. There's autonomy in medical education and practice uh, the medical profession in the last 150 years has benefited with, uh, and enjoyed an enormous increase in social prestige and in income. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, the uh, social contract has never been fully uh, uh, executed and there remain ways in which both medicine and society uh, have not fulfilled their end of the bargain fully. In terms of uh, medicine and uh, its success in serving society, it's not done a good job in terms of costs. And, and uh, the uh, origin of soaring costs in medical inflation are multifactorial. But we should recognize that the way we educate doctors and practice medicine is a contributor to this. We profess to be scientific, but we teach and practice in a uh, very non-scientific fashion. 
uh, instead of ordering tests or procedures because they are indicated by the patient circumstances, we've always had a tendency to get everything is there and see what the data is show and then shows and then goes from, go from there. But that's obviously a very expensive and non parsimonious way of practicing medicine. We've had an emphasis on uh, treatment rather than on prevention or public health or social determinants of health. In my view, uh, the issue of prevention is an issue of morals and values. In other words, the reason to be concerned with prevention is because it's the right thing to do, not because it will necessarily save money. In fact, the economic benefits of preventive medicine are unclear. And some medical economists argue that on balance, there may not be any gains if we do a, an excellent job with prevention. Uh, the reason is that the data that shows prevention reduces cost applies to populations of patients under 65. So an insurance company that is insuring a large corporation and is able to put into place various wellness and prevention programs, that company may end up paying less uh, in, in terms of payments uh, uh, for its population. But if one considers retirees and the population over 65, the uh, costs amount greatly, the cost of end of life care, the cost of cancer treatment or coronary artery bypass or whatever it may be. Uh, the cost of old age and dying are extremely high. Uh, and these have to be taken into account as well. So these are reasons that I suggest that uh, the emphasis on prevention is and, and it should be uh, uh, underscored because it's the right thing to do, not especially because it might save money, uh, that aspect is unclear. Another area that the medical profession and academic medicine has received criticism is in not pr producing the types of doctors that society allegedly needs. This has to do with doctors having the human qualities and the cultural understanding and ability to uh, comfort and to advise and to be anchors of support uh, that our patients need. Uh, it also has to do with uh, specialty type and physician distribution. We regularly hear the charge that there are too many uh, uh, specialists, not enough uh, generalists, that physicians concentrate in certain areas, but not in other areas. Uh, these charges are regularly made. And then a final uh, deficiency in terms of how well we have served the social contract comes from the attention of uh, academic medicine and medical profession uh, on uh, individuals, our historic uh, mission, but not on the system itself. So we have a system that, we, that is enormously wasteful, uh, that is expensive, that is very inefficient, and sometimes insensitive in the delivery of healthcare. Next, considerable uh, concern about the greed and self-serving behavior that has afflicted the medical profession. Uh, there's no question in my mind that doctors should be well paid, but how much is enough? Ophthalmologists are happy if the payment for cataract extractions are sufficiently high. And if they're not, they'll just lower their threshold for how much of cataract is needed before surgery is performed. Nephrologists are happy if dialysis payments are sufficient care about little else. WAMC is happy if NIH budgets and research support are large enough, uh, but has traditionally not thought about many other issues. What about the size of academic medical centers? It's essential that an academic medical center be large, 
because we need plenty of patients for students, for research, for residents and fellows to, uh, to learn with. We need patients to be involved with clinical research and trials. The faculty also needs to see patients to keep their clinical skills sharp so they can continue to be seen as our nation's best clinicians and to serve other docs by being sources of referrals for tough cases. However, academic medicine has always uh, uh, meant been uh, existed to support the system of medical practice, but not to be the system of medical practice. And this is what we've lost sight of in recent decades. Uh, keep in mind that to Abraham Flexner, as he endorsed the full-time system for American medical schools, defined full-time as six full-time professors in the entire medical school. Well, clearly we need more than that, uh, but how large do we need to be? Uh, we've moved into an era in which the goals has often seemed to be uh, to see more and more patients for the sake of generating revenue as opposed to doing academic work. Clinical product productivity is uh, a term often uh, used and it doesn't refer to the quality of a physician's work, but uh, the dollars that that physician brings in through practice. Promotions are often made for the dollars brought in uh, even to physicians who do not engage in serious teaching or research. And then a third uh, issue is the question of how we measure ourselves. Uh, once upon a time, success at an academic health center was defined by the quality of the work. And great teaching hospitals were traditionally the least profitable hospitals in the country. Community hospitals with, without teaching research were much more profitable, but the teaching health hospitals took pride in that uh, because it meant that they were doing good work and investing resources back into making medicine better. Uh, this is a view that we've lost today. Uh, the, we're even at uh, the allegedly most academic uh, medical schools and teaching hospitals. The goal seems to be how much money can you generate as opposed to what work you are doing? Next slide, please. Uh, uh, society has not fully met its end of the social contract either. Uh, it has responded positively, as I indicated before, with uh, an enormous amount of, of financial support. But this support is irregular, irregular particularly in research and education, uh, because one never knows if next year's NIH budget will be larger or smaller, and that makes planning and long-term projects uh, much more difficult. Uh, uh, and in addition, many hospitals have been very poorly supportive, and I'm referring particularly to municipal hospitals, which have long been greatly under, uh, underfunded. They've contracted or closed, leaving lots of uh, economically and socially disadvantaged individuals without much care. When I arrived in St. Louis as a resident, we had three public hospitals in St. Louis. Now we have zero. Uh, society has also in recent decades imposed enormous regulatory burdens and administrative costs on our academic medical centers and on the profession. Uh, I'll say no more about that at this time, but those are very important and real problems today. And then in recent decades, we've developed an academic mo uh, uh, a business model of uh, quality uh, and not a professional model. Uh, we have come to define uh, quality as how many patients we see, how quickly we do, not the quality of care that we provide. Uh, this is a subject that I focused on uh, intensely in my book, Time to Heal, because we have been losing the time to heal. Time is necessary for learning, to re for reflection. It's, uh, time is necessary for the practice of medicine to, to be reflective, 
to be able to provide the education and the counseling and the comfort patients need. But time has been in very short supply in the last couple of decades with an increasing, as physicians are increasingly on a treadmill that says, see more and more patients faster and faster. Uh, and you will be judged by how many patients you see and the revenue you generate as opposed to the quality of the work. And in my view, this is the most serious challenge facing the practice and learning in medicine today. Uh, next slide, please. Who leads going forward, medicine or society? In the area of undergraduate medical education and the medical school, leadership clearly came from the medical profession. The creation of the modern medical school was directly related to the creation of, the, of academic medicine as a profession in the United States and the emergence of the research university. A generation later, the medical profession provided leadership in the creation of our system of graduate medical education, residency and clinical fellowships. In terms of the standards of care, that has been and remains largely an internal issue. No one's going to tell a neurosurgeon how to take out a glioblastoma or, in, or uh, and external agencies are not going to try to define standards of care. But everything else, uh, uh, leadership and direction has come from society. Uh, the, the evolution of our healthcare system, uh, the organization, the financing has uh, clearly come from society, not from the medical profession. Uh, more recent leadership in terms of gender, religious, ethnic equality, uh, medicine has gotten better, but we've been responding to external forces. The leadership has not come from within. And this is true of racial equality today, which as Dr. Sigler pointed out is uh, a subject of my ongoing investigation and a new book that I'm writing. Uh, every step forward in the uh, attainment of greater rate racial equity in medicine has come from outside the profession. It has not come from within, whether it's the desegregation of the wards, whether it's uh, the various affirmative action programs. Uh, it has all come, the integration of hospitals. Uh, this has uh, all come uh, in medicine's response to the forces of society. It's not reflected uh, internal leadership from within the profession. Next slide, please. These are extraordinarily complex issues. And uh, this slide uh, illustrates some of the ways in which that is true. Uh, consider geographic and specialty distribution. We say that we need more generalists and fewer specialists. But number one, how do we know that? Manpower uh, projections have been uh, extraordinarily inaccurate and incorrect over time. With an aging population, you can argue that we need more specialty care, cancer care, geriatrics. We need urologists uh, to do more and more prostate procedures and so forth. And as we achieve a specialty distribution, uh, how is this done? Uh, because various fields have always been in competition with each other. Uh, and, and medical students have chosen careers based on uh, the intellectual attractions of the fields. The, uh, for example, in the 1960s, there was statistics, and this remains true today, Ophthalmology was a very hot field. Otolaryngology was not. This had nothing to do with incomes or lifestyles. The two were, were and remain very similar. But it has to do with the perceived attractiveness of op and excitement of ophthalmology as a field vis-a-vis -vis otolaryngology. Radiology, once upon a time, was the least attractive 
field of all and had difficulty attracting enough residents until the 1970s when it became among the very hottest and that was a reflection of the arrival of non-invasive imaging. Uh, we talk about uh, the need for more doctors in rural areas, uh, but the incentives for uh, living in cities have long been present in our society, and even more so in the profession. The 1920 census was the first census in which 50% of the population lived in cities rather than rural areas. But by that time already, 80% of the physicians were in, in cities. And there were distinct attractions of cities uh, to doctors because of the professional support that was available, not to mention doctors as a group being a, a, a cultivated group and the attractions of the cities were very conducive to those interests. What the issue of specialty and, ge and geographic distribution really comes down to, in my view, uh, is the need for us to deal with traditional American individualism. Our country has had the ethic that individuals can decide their own future. So medical students will decide where they want to go to practice or what area to go into. This is in sharp dif difference uh, to England, for example, where these decisions are made by the government. Uh, there are only a certain amount of residencies in a particular field per year. And if you don't get a residency of your, uh, uh, in that field, you can't go to a second or third or fourth tier program. You have to do a residency in somewhere else. And similarly, once you've obtained your specialty training, you go where there are openings. So if you are a uh, urologist, you go to communities that at the time need urologists. You can't just uh, go anywhere you wish. You can, but you would be a general physician, not a urologist. So this uh, American tradition of individualism and individual liberty is very much intertwined with the uh, geographic and specialty distribution. We have frequent charges that we uh, need more physicians in primary care. Uh, but whose responsibility is this and how are primary care physicians obtained? Uh, it goes beyond paying primary care physicians more. And it has to do very much with the respect that our society gives them because the same foundations and, and policy groups that argue for more primary care also call primary care physician, uh, professions providers. And there is no distinction between a primary care physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. They're all considered providers. Uh, and with this type of diminution of the respect of the field, uh, it, it, want, uh, it can be more track, uh, difficult to attract people to it. And this goes uh, beyond payment uh, and more about how a field is, value, is valued in the eyes of society. Uh, another example of complexity is the assumption of responsibility. It is axiomatic in medical education that residents assume responsibility and make decisions and do things on their own. But it is also, uh, this, this also raises a question, who are the patients and how much supervision there, there is? And in fact, uh, the patients that we learn on historically and even today have been those of lower socioeconomic status uh, and not everyone, not the, and then we have uh, the issue of primary, uh, preventive care because the much preventive care is beyond the capacity of a physician to administer. We, we, we can educate our and, and counsel our patients, but it takes much more to motivate a person to lose weight, get exercise, stop smoking and so forth. And the farther you get from the doctor-patient relationship, the uh, more difficult it is for the individual physician uh, uh, to intervene. Uh, uh, we can tell, uh, complain that our patients 
uh, are non-compliant and use that disparaging term. But if, if, if a patient doesn't have the uh, financial means to pay for medications, that puts it in a whole different category. Uh, we can talk about good nutrition, but uh, if a you have a single wealth mother on welfare, uh, a gallon of Coke uh, is much less expensive than uh, a quart of milk. So these sorts of uh, uh, social issues uh, start uh, uh, appearing and the further we get from the immediate contact of the patient, the more powerful these issues are. Next slide, please. Um, we have many opportunities to improve the social contract and to do better work. Uh, we need to uh, not only appreciate the progress that we've made, uh, but to use that understanding to uh, identify what is transient and what is constant, uh, to defend our core principles and values, even as everything around it changes. And what are these core values? Well the need to strive for perfection, not just competence, uh, to work continually to produce better doctors in the, for, in the future through education and expand medicine's capacity through research, to develop the problem solving skills and the ability to manage uncertainty and, and encourage curiosity among our trainees and our doctors, reinforce outros of dedication to hard work, service to society, remembering that medicine exists for society, not society for medicine, and that medicine is a public trust. And to be very vigorous in our defense of medical education as university level professional education, and not to allow it to devolve into vocational training. I will say for now that in my view, there are very profound forces in our society that would have medical education devolve into vocational training. And I think that's an existential threat that needs to be uh, combated. Next slide. Uh, uh, solutions, in my view, come largely from within, uh, there's uh, within the core of medicine. Uh, defending our core principles, uh, scientific reasoning and management, uh, uh, critical thinking, uh, uh, that, that is a key element in my view of reducing the problem of exorbitant medical costs. Uh, expanding our core principles for contemporary situations, consider admissions. It has always been the goal of medicine to have the best people enter medicine. But to do so, we need to draw from all segments of society, not just particularly privileged group. Uh, so as we actively work today to make the medical, medical careers more available to those from less affluent groups or more underprivileged groups, we're actually uh, acting in a fashion consistent with our core uh, values. Uh, a key to doing so will be to better refine our abilities of assessment and judgment. Uh, we know the types of doctors that we wish to have. We can talk about their intellectual curiosity, their aptitudes, their human qualities. It's not easy to actually recognize those qualities in a particular applicant before you. We, we are working to do so with the new MCAT uh, examination and holistic admission practices, but there still is a long work to be done to actually be able to identify those applicants who really are the people we wish to have as future physicians. And then lastly, uh, I think it's very important to maintain our optimism as we go about the work. Uh, our work. Medicine has never been without problems. Uh, it's always had its messiness and its complexity and its challenges. On the other hand, we have overcome our problems uh, with time. And there is no field, in my view, that is more exciting today or has 
uh, greater potential to contribute to society or has greater promise for the future than medicine. Uh, as I look to the audiences to which I speak and I saw photos of, of some of you, there are a lot of uh, students and residents and fellows and, and, and junior physicians uh, uh, in the audience. And I would say to you that I'm jealous I, I, I'm rounding uh, third base in my own career. Uh, uh, you're beginning yours. Uh, I'm envious. I wish I could be back where you, where, where you are. There is simply uh, no prof profession or human activity, in my view, more exciting and better able to serve the public good than medicine. Well, with those observations, I'll conclude and thank uh, uh, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Siegler for the opportunity of being here with you today. And I'm glad to entertain any comments or questions that there might be. Well, I want to thank you so much for giving that talk. Um, you, you, you highlighted all the challenges and now we're left with where do we go from here? Let me just pick up one of the comments in the chat. I think that was um, apropos. It says, as the regulatory burdens that society places on medical education and practice increase, the ability of medicine to lead in those areas and or self-police diminishes greatly. In other words, the cause of death of medicine as a fairly autonomous and exceptional profession will be um, by paper cuts. Um, so. And it is interesting because there have been, um, you know, efforts from within the profession, like there have been resident strikes, there have been lawsuits against the NRMP for, um, you know, violating competition. So I'd like to hear a little more of what you think about those. Well, regulation is a huge problem today. Number one, this is not unique to medicine. We're in a regulatory bureaucratic society now. So the problems that we face are in some, in this sense, a microcosm of the problems that our society as, as a whole faces. As we come back to medicine in particular, I think to answer the question that uh, was raised, we have to go back to who establishes those regulations and why and what are the regulations attempting to uh, uh, accomplish. So I think the solution going forward would be more vigorous discussions among medical leaders and policy leaders about the idea of, of regulation, what is a reasonable regulation to have because we do need to be accountable and responsible, but when does it become unnecessarily onerous? And to the degree we as a profession are doing outstanding work that is clearly recognizable to, out, to, 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 to all, then our position in this grows uh, increasingly stronger because the public would likely side with the medical profession. So doing good work and going back to the table at the time that where, where regulations are being created, I think is the direction to go. Okay, um, Carolyn, you wanna take it away? Sure, uh, thank you so much for this talk. It got me thinking about um, a lot of things, a couple different directions, but I wanted to pick up on something you mentioned about how residents often work with patients of a lower socioeconomic status who have maybe less access to primary care or even preventative care. Um, and I was just thinking about how that, the structure of that <laughs> probably isn't going to change anytime soon. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about what would be required at the undergraduate medical education level to sort of prepare students to better understand those circumstances. Um, I, in my own work, I think I've been thinking recently about this idea of vulnerability and the sort of usefulness of that term. Maybe there are some some limits to it. So it, certainly if you have thoughts about that, I'd love to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. The 
fundamental principle of undergraduate medical education is learning by doing, which is why the clerkship became such a powerful and innovative departure in medical education. The fundamental principle of graduate medical education is the assumption of responsibility, doing things without someone immediately looking over your shoulder, though doing it within an appropriate safety net so that there are people nearby and immediately available if you need help or consultation. So that question of who the patients are becomes a more pertinent one with residency than it does with medical students because the residents are doing things themselves or making decisions themselves. The system of medical education was created at a time we had a two tier healthcare system and those were cared for without charge in our various teaching hospitals uh, did so with the uh, understanding that they could be they would be cared for by the the residents and in exchange they got free care or care that was significantly uh, uh, less than cost um, and we have been moving toward a one class system of care uh, ultimately, uh, we need to do better in achieving that goal. We need to, and, and as we pursue this, we need to make certain that appropriate supervision is given our residents. We have, today, residency training is more closely supervised than it was when Richie Kahn or Bruce Spy or, or and I went through. And I think that's a good thing because it, provide security for the patient and for the public. And ultimately in an ideal society, uh, all patients will be uh, uh, agreeable in, in, under certain circumstances to having residents make certain decisions or do certain things. Uh, the bank president, including the uh, uh, worker from McDonald's. And that maybe the chair of surgery might operate on uh, an indigent patient and uh, uh, the chief resident of surgery on uh, the, the chairman of the corporation. So these are uh, issues of equality and justice and evolution toward a one class system of healthcare, which is a reflection of the values that we have as a country. But these are the ways that we would need to go to accomplish that. And I think that by making certain that we do a better job of balancing the independence that residents need with appropriate supervision to provide maximum safety uh, can be a useful device and strategy in that process. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, oh, I would. Things, sure. Or Tarek, you have a question. Okay, yes. Ahead. So my question would be: My experience is most of the regulation or the rules that's being implemented, they are basically focused on two things. One, they and to put it like lamely or loosely, I feel like most of the regulation is to protect the patient from the physicians now. So multiple timeout, multiple things, all those things, and also on quality control. Like when, and that's indirectly to the money. So the, based on what you said or what you're in, my thinking would be is part of the social contract is that the society is telling physicians that we don't trust you as much, quote unquote, and you're too greedy, so slow down. So where do, the system go wrong because most of the regulation are basically to protect the patient now. Uh, we have uh, in general, and that's why I do all the steps in place. And the other thing is quality control, like which is basically compliance throughout the day, CME for the year. So does it mean along the line, the people that are being trained are not as good? So. Did we not do a good enough job ourselves? So society came and they are telling us what to do. Well, thank you for those observations and for the question. In terms of regulations, 
I think one's values and perspective influence how that question is phrased. You can say this as you did, that regulations are put in place to protect patients from the doctors. One could also say that the safety of the patient has always been paramount in the practice, in the teaching and practice of medicine remains paramount uh, today. That happens to be my personal perspective on it. So insofar as we can learn through research and documentation, ways to practice more safely, uh, this is a good thing and consistent with our core mission and values. And what is interesting about this, I think, is that much of safety is a, a low tech type of thing, taking timeouts, making sure that the appropriate limb or side of the body for surgery is, is marked, uh, things of that sort. Uh, which is one reason why it took a while for the safety movement to, to gain intellectual respect, respectability within the profession, because this is very low tech. It's not creating new knowledge per se. It's common sense and putting that into uh, application. So I think more research and a greater respect for common sense in medical practice is something that we in medicine can do to facilitate the safety movement. And, uh, but any, all physicians from all times, to my knowledge, have, have, have always endorsed the concept of safety and this is consistent with the core value. In terms of quality, the, the great problem we have in quality, this actually became clear to me when I attended a conference at University of Chicago many years ago on quality of care. And the keynote speaker was a philosopher who uh, argued that we will never be able to measure quality because quality is essentially a qualitative concept, not quantitative. You know, how can one measure the beauty of the Mona Lisa or fear or any significant human emotion? Uh, so we end up measuring what's measurable and not necessarily what's important. So we can uh, look at the computer record. And did the uh, doctor prescribe a baby aspirin to someone with coronary artery disease? Uh, we can check those things off. But uh, you know, the larger dimension of quality and care, the ability to uh, manage uncertainty, to uh, uh, handle complexity to, to figure out an unknown, to do a procedure very effectively and safely and skillfully. These are things we're really not able uh, to measure. Um, and, and this is a huge challenge. And I think the most important challenge in the area of quality research to have better hand. We know what we want by quality. Uh, if we see it, we can recognize it, but it's hard to measure quality. Uh, someone who can figure out a way to measure quality will deserve a Nobel Prize in medicine, in my opinion. Let me just um, add another comment from the chat. It said, thank you for your insightful presentation. As a follow-up question, does the relationship between regulation and medicine vary by specialty? And are there specialties in medicine where you feel that regulation might be more helpful to improve quality? That, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I am unaware of any significant difference among specialties in terms of regulations. There are regulations uh, for all. Uh, the specifics are going to vary from specialty to specialty. I'm not certain offhand that I can think of certain specialties that are much more highly regulated than others. Uh, I could be mistaken, but offhand, it seems to me to be a general issue. And the second part of the question was, does regulation help? You got this. Is there any, um, are there any specialties in medicine where you think that regulation might be more helpful to improve quality? Is there anything that's kind of out there that um, regulations might be helpful. Um, um, 
I'm I I I'm I'm not certain. I, I I think that I think that standards are needed. So in that sense, yes, uh, medical education and practice in all specialties and in all um, um, in all in, in, yeah in all, in all specialties and at all levels, whether trainees or practitioners, we need standards. And we've always had standards and they've been constructive. We've had regulatory bodies that make certain that individuals adhere to standards or that institutions adhere to standards. Uh, and I say regulation, and I'm just responding offhand. I, I, I see it as a double-edged sword because you need standards and individuals or institutions that are not meeting standards need to be held accountable for the public good. And at the same time, standards could be onerous, they can be ill-founded, they can be uh, uh, have inadvertent consequences that outweigh the gain. Uh, and so I think that ultimately, one needs to become very contextual and specific and concrete. What standard are we talking about and in what circumstance? I'm not certain it's possible to give one general answer that applies to everything. I think one would need to get particular and concrete, discuss a particular standard regulation that issue. Yeah, I mean, I think on a practical level, you know, it's kind of as from where I sit in healthcare, feels a little bit like the chicken and the egg because the more, you know, money drives medicine, it, you know, compresses the time we have with patients. It requires more um, supervision and more safety because we're putting people in a much more dangerous position. Doctors are going, and, and all healthcare professionals are going faster than it is reasonable and, um, uh, we live in challenging times. I think it's good that you're telling us not to lose hope, but I think a lot of times many of us feel a sense of, we know that our practices would be better, patient safety would be better, the um, outcomes would be better if we had more time with patients and weren't like such hamsters on a wheel or, you know, going so fast in clinic or in the operating room that we've got to turn stuff over because we've got to keep, you know, this throughput and the language, you know, personally has been toxic, you know, patient throughput. And there's a lot of things that I just feel like are just very demeaning and, you know, um, harsh, I guess, from being a little older is, you know, you know, uh, you know, and the metrics, I, I call it the mad metrics of medicine, the way you measure things. And you're right, it is hard to measure quality, but the one thing is you can experience quality just like you can experience those other ephemeral things like beauty and justice and other things. So I'll let you end up on that and then we'll give you a little downtime before you do the yeah. effort. Let me just reply to that, Mindy. What you're suggesting is a test testable hypothesis. Just, just providing more time result in better care. For example, consider the a leaky initiative that in the Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's a matter of pride to me that this initiative came out of the book Time to Heal because David Hellman at Johns Hopkins agreed with the idea that you needed more time to do the job right. And so he created the leaky initiative. Residents on their leaky rotations have half the number of patients as residents under standard medicine rotations. This is an experiment in internal medicine. While they are in the leaky rotation, uh, they have more time not only to spend with their patients, but for reading and reflection and conferences. They make home visits to their patients and really get to know the patient as person. The main cost of this is that someone has to take care of the patients that are not seen by uh, the leaky residents. Um, so uh, David was able to get funding to support this from uh, uh, Mrs. Leakey, that's whose name is with the initiative. Um, and the money is used to pay for 
the salaries of nurse practitioners and moonlighters or physician assistants to see the patients that the residents are not seeing by virtue of their reduced load. And, it, and the Leakey program has been studied and there have been published results, but basically the Leakey residents are much happier and much more fulfilled and have much more self-worth than other rotations. They are, they feel they learn more in the leaky rotation and testing results have shown that. They provide better quality of care because the time they take the time and attention to do the job right uh, as measured by you know, hospital readmission rates within 30 days after pneumonia or congestive heart fail. There are a number of crude measurements of care we have and the leaky residents provide better care in those standards. And they practice more cost efficient medicine too because they take things out and get what's needed not just everything that's, that's there to have it in case it might be needed. So the results are really very impressive and I've suggested to David that this study be continued to examine the practice patterns and habits of the residents five years, 10 years into practice. And if you can show that those differences are persistent, uh, then you can demonstrate an import, an impact on the trainees and that this is a better way to practice medicine. So it, uh, data can be brought to bear and the other issue is who will listen to the medical point of view and to the degree that medicine is greatly respected as a profession, our word and our, uh, what we attest is given greater weight to. Part of the problem is that we have lost much of the public respect we once enjoyed. When you and I began medicine, the medical profession was in public opinion polls, the second most prestigious and valued profession in the United States, second only to justices of the US Supreme Court. We've had a marked diminution in our status uh, since then because we've been greedy and self-serving. To the degree we can recapture the high ground that will be powerful in making things better because the public will better, more fully feel that we are speaking for the public good and not just for our own. And that's part of the solution too. And just a follow up. So one of the other um, in the, the other thing in the chat said, in addition to looking at your uh, what you were talking about, the leaky group, they said we not only need to look at the um, the outcome from the patients who were studied, but also uh, not the patients, the, the physicians who were studied, but also you have to see if the um, control group getting worse care than usual by having overburdened nurse practitioners and you know physicians assistants. So you'd have to look at the downside, but I think what we'll- Excellent do, point. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thought. So I think what we'll do is we'll wrap it up. So you have a few minutes to just, you know, get a drink and stretch your legs before the afternoon session. And on behalf of the McLean Center, I wanna thank you so much for coming and giving a very thought provoking and um, intellectually stimulating uh, talk today. We really appreciate it.